Okay, so we are now in our second session uh, of our Reform Worship series. Uh, last week, what we have done is that we have uh, defined uh, what is biblical worship. Uh, how many people we are here right now? There are six people. Uh, all of us, we can have, you know, six of you plus me, seven. We can have seven definitions of what worship is. You know, and, uh, and there are 40,000 over Christian denominations and each of them may have different uh, definitions. Uh, but then again, ultimately we want to ask what is uh, true biblical worship, you know, um, and, and come back to what scripture says about it. Um, just a summary of our previous lesson. Biblical idea of worship in both testaments is a reverential attitude of mind and body, the feeling of awe, veneration, obedience, adoration with religious service toward God. So again, worship is about God, right? Um, and uh, we can have many definitions of what worship is, and ultimately, you know, we. That's why what Sunday worship service is called worship service because it is service towards god if we make worship to be ours to be about ourselves then service is about us we are to be served on sunday worship you know if if worship is about us then veneration is about ourselves not about god it, it is to be thankful of ourselves right uh, instead of god right uh, and of course anyone who would worship god must be holy uh, we have discussed this uh, last week, right? Uh, not everyone uh, can worship, right? Um, and we also discussed that um, there are two kinds of uh, worship. One is direct worship, yeah, that involves praise, prayer, and sacrifice. Whereas the second type is life worship, yeah. And ultimately, uh, if worship is about ourselves again, we bring in. Uh, activities from life and we define uh, what is direct worship so then again again God alone defines worship and he institute how we ought to worship him All right so he alone gets to decide and in speaking about anyone who would worship God must be holy right um, yeah Sorry, before we talk about that, right, uh, we just glance through what happened, um, what we discussed last week as well. Uh, I point out in the Old Testament, uh, there are continual sacrifices uh, and ceremonial purity by a human priest. And there are feast days and sacraments uh, involved. So that is in the Old Testament. Yeah? Uh, J.V. Pascal Calvin identified circumcision uh, purifications, sacrifices, and rites from the law of Moses as Old Testament sacraments. But in the wake of the ministry of Christ, that there are now only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yeah. So in the Old Testament, the sacraments are quite a number of things, Yeah. Uh, like what we have read just now. Uh, and even in the Old Testament, right, there are praise and prayer, uh, proclamation by Levitical priesthood. But when we come to the New Testament, these things continue in principle. It doesn't continue exactly the way it is, but it, it continues in principle. Yeah. The final sacrifice, still God or not? God, in a sense, it has been done once and for all by Jesus Christ. The ceremonial, the purification is done by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, and on the Lord's Day, that is when we come together to worship, not on the feast days as in the Old Testament, uh, uh, but on the Lord's Day. Yeah. We come and we uh, 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 um, involve ourselves in the sacraments, um, and yet also praise, prayer, and proclamation by the universal priesthood. So, at, in the Old Testament, only the priests can worship God, which we will look at it later on. Yeah? Because today, this is what we will be looking at, these things. Yeah? 
And so who can worship God? That's the question. Who is fit to worship Him? Today's session is about our fitness to worship God. Nobody can just simply just worship Him and God, in a sense, our sacrifices are immediately accepted by God. But that something has to be done for us to purify us to atone for our sins so that when we come before God, our sacrifices are accepted and that we can worship Him uh, acceptably. Yeah? There is a need for atonement. Uh, God commands Psalms 50 verse 5, Gather my sins together unto me, those that have made a covenant with by sacrifice. So, to come to Him, there needs to be a sacrifice. Like we have talked about last week, prayer, praise, and sacrifice. Yeah, uh, And the question had to be answered was this, how could sinful men approach unto such a holy, awesome, powerful, and wrathful God? How would the praises, prayers, and songs be acceptable by God? Psalms 24, 3 to 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. And the truth is, no one has clean hands on their own. No one has pure hearts on their own. Right? All have lifted his soul to vanity and swore deceits. That's the truth, right? No one has clean and perfect hearts. So there is a need for atonement. Because our hands and our hearts are tainted that even our good deeds uh, are tainted by our selfish desires. If you uh, look at the mafia, <laughs> right? In the name of caring for their family, they would um, commit criminal acts right to grow the wealth of their family so that their families are taken care of. to them they are doing a good act so that's the point that even our good acts are tainted and fail and falls short um, uh, to the holiness and the perfection of who God is so hands and hearts need to be made clean by the atonement now, the word atonement uh, is a word that is made up of two words derived from at and one man. Meaning to say, it is to be one with. That is the meaning of atonement. Leviticus 17, verse 11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So we know that only the shedding of blood can achieve an atonement. Alright? Even in Leviticus 17, yeah? Only the worship of one who is holy is accepted. Psalms 24, 3 to 4, right? Just now we have read this. Uh, no one can perform the duty of worship nor worship God acceptably without atonement because by nature we are children of wrath we are enemies against God we hate God we are not one with Him that's the meaning of atonement we are not one with God because we are in enmity against Him we give in to our sinful desires and our sinful impulses. So our hearts and our hands are not clean, are not one with God. So atonement is needed. Yeah? And that is the overriding theme and purpose of the Old Testament worship. Um, and you see that in the temple or the tabernacle, and the sacrifices and the feast days, all these points to the atonement. Um, but in the Old Testament, 
where was um, atonement for man's sins made? It, it is in the tabernacle or the temple when the temple was built. Yeah, uh, its whole purpose was to show people how they could be clean before God and to worship Him acceptably. That's the point of the tabernacle and the temple. Yeah. How? It is via the Old Testament sacrificial system. Yeah. What do we mean by that? We'll look at that. Yeah. Uh, but basically, it is a blueprint given to Moses at Sinai. Remember? The Lord is the one who gave these laws to Moses, even including the laws of atonement, the law of the tabernacle, of sacrifices, you know, or as, and etc. Yeah. So these are given to Moses at Sinai. This is how the tabernacle looks. Yeah. Uh, if you look at all these, the whole courtyard of the tabernacle, it is all built up and covered up. The only entrance is through uh, the gate there, right? And only the priests can enter the tabernacle. Meaning, only the priests can enter in to be atoned or to make atonement for the children of Israel on behalf of the children of Israel and they themselves only can worship God. But they must go through cleansing first. They must go through atonement first. So what happens is the priest must offer a sacrifices or the people of Israel will bring the sacrifices. They are very good butchers. They butcher sacrifices morning, evening, every single day. And they burn uh, the, the, the burnt offering on the altar uh, uh, to burn. And after that, after the the, the the animals are sacrificed and burnt, right? As in, um, and they would have to wash their hands, yeah. Uh, and then they slowly progress. There's a progression. So even the atonement, that the significance of this is there is a progression, a process that is very specific, specifically commanded to Moses. Yeah. So from the outer court progressing all the way to the holy place. And even the holy of holies, only the high priest can enter once a year. Yeah. So we look at the bronze altar. Yeah. The people and the priests would bring their sacrifices for atonement. Yeah. They will burn uh, these, uh, these um, sacrifices on the altar. Yeah, they will bring their burn offering, their cereal offering, the peace offering, and, and their guilt offerings yeah, to atone for their sins and trespasses. Yeah? And this is called the sacrificial system of the Old Testament because it is a system of five kinds of sacrifices. One is the burnt offering of the Old Testament. It is a burning of the whole male animal for general unintentional sins yeah the offerer leans on animal um, and the blood spring are sprinkled on the altar and then the whole animal will be burnt it is actually a vicarious atonement meaning to say this burnt offering signifies that in the burning of this animal it fully satisfied the wrath of God on the priests and the children of Israel. That is the meaning of vicarious. It satisfies the wrath of God. Yeah? The second kind is the cereal or the offering of grain, the grain offering, uh, the other word. Uh, it is, they bring their dough or is something like uh, the oven baked bread or their roti chanai or their roti naan chapati right uh, or even deep fried uh, donuts and they bring together with the burnt offering yeah and uh, this signify good works offered only after the atonement 
even the good works cannot be sac- accepted before the atonement. So there is a process, yeah, a progression. The next sacrifice will be the peace offering. Yeah, it is an offering consisting of fat and on entrails uh, to God. The remainder of the meat was divided into three and to share among the priests, the offerer, and the poor. Yeah. When there is atonement, basically what this peace offering is about is to signify that now there is peace between man and God. At one moment, remember? Yeah. There is now peace or some reconciliation with God. The next sacrifice will be the guilt or the sin offering. Yeah? It is an offering for specific. The burnt offering was general sin, unintentional. Now it is for specific, unintentional sin. Emphasis here, unintentional. Yeah? And different animals, uh, like male or female, for different people, and these are burnt outside the camp. These are not burnt in the camp. Yeah. This guilt or trespass offering, uh, the next one, yeah, is of, for, of money. Instead of an animal, it is of money. Right? Or the, for specific sins of ignorance or fraud or, or something unintentionally cheated person of money. You know, uh, these belong to the trespass offering yeah categorized under the guilt yeah uh, anyways this is uh, the formula you don't have to talk about that <laughs> more specific what was the common theme in this sacrificial system unintentional right Meaning to say, this sacrificial system is offered only for unintentional sins, not for intentional sins. Numbers are 15, 24 to 26. Yeah? Um, then it shall be, if ought be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering for a sweet savour unto the Lord with his meat offering, and his drink offering, according to the manner, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance. They, they do not know, meaning to say they do not know that they have committed this sin, and then they realized it. Yeah? And they shall bring their offering. A sacrifice, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord and their sin offering before the Lord for their, again, ignorance. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger and the sojourner among them seeing all the people were in ignorance. So again, this sacrificial system was offered only for unintentional sins. And so in the Old Testament, there was no sacrifice for intentional sins. Yeah? So what happens? There was only death. Yeah? Numbers 15, 30 to 31, the same chapter that we've read just now. But the soul that doth ought presumptuously whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that should shall be uh, utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. So he shall be cut off from the people. Now I will go forward perhaps some of us may start to feel discouraged now because all of us, most of the sins that we do are intentional sins. <laughs> so we will um, discuss that later on, but we'll go through the furnitures of the tabernacle. There is significance to this, yeah? 
the lever, meaning to say, it is a furniture used uh, to for cleansing. They are to wash their hands, yeah, the feet for the priests to wash their hands, yeah. Uh, after slaughtering the animals, doing all the burnt offering sacrificial system, now they are to wash their hands uh, before entering the tabernacle. Yeah, it is for priests only. The hands and feet are to be washed, and um, yeah. And after the washing, oh, it's being blocked there, but it's okay. Uh, the priest can enter into the tabernacle. Yeah. And once they go inside the tabernacle, the next piece of furniture is the table of, of showbread. Uh, just now the cereal offering that the people bring, the bread, flat breads, they will be arranged on the table. Yeah. Uh, on this piece of furniture and it is it has to be 12 cakes of bread uh, signifying the 12 tribes of Israel yeah and it is only uh, it can only be eaten by the priests and so what happens um, the priests will gather around this table they will hold hands yeah the one hand they will hold each other's hand the other hand, they will eat the bread. It signifies fellowship. Yeah, so worship is not just vertical towards God. It is done in a manner where even in the fellowship of the priests, which involves eating together, right, uh, talking and 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 exhorting one another. Um, this is in itself is worship unto the Lord. Yeah. The next piece of the furniture will be the um, the golden lampstand. Yeah, uh, it is made out of solid gold, hammered. It is not joined together. Uh, its total weight is forty three kilograms. Yeah, uh, two times in a day they will have to refill the olive oil. Yeah, to keep the lambs burning and the wicks trimmed. If they are burnt part of the string, they will have to trim it, right? Uh, to maintain it. And this must always be lit. And its significance was to convey to the priests and the people of Israel that God's presence is constantly among them. Yeah. The next piece of the furniture will be the golden altar of incense. Yeah, two times daily they will have to replenish and make sure it is enough for the incense um, to be burned throughout the whole day, twenty four hours. Right, uh, it will be sprinkled with blood. The blood that is taken from the animal slaughtered, they will take some of the blood and sprinkle here as well. Yeah. And it is a secret formula of spices and herbs. Only they will know. <laughs> okay? Only they will know. They will know which ratio to adjust. You know, and, and it, it, um, there is a, a, an aroma, a distinct and unique. Yeah? And it signifies the prayers of the high priest. It is at this furniture that the high priest will offer prayers unto the Lord. Uh, as the incense uh, arises uh, to the Lord. Yeah. And in the Holy of Holies, the, the, the uh, furniture that we know, uh, and most acquainted of, is the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Inside, there is the ten, a tablet, literal tablet of the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod, and a, and a pot of manna, yeah, uh, its chests are closed by the mercy seat. The mercy seat being where the two cherubims will spread their wings over it. Yeah, it is closed. It is concealed. Yeah, what does it mean? There is some significance to this, because when you look at the Ten Commandments, it is being covered by what the mercy seat. Because for the children of Israel, when the Ten Commandments was given at Mount Sinai, the moment 
the Ten Commandments was given, what happened? The people broke all of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. And it signifies that Yes, the law of God is in there and the mercy of God rests on top of the laws. That when God looks down on the Ten Commandments, He looks through His mercy. Because God's throne is established on mercy, on the Ten Commandments, on the laws. Yeah? And if you remember the story, uh, of the wilderness, uh, the manna was given. You know? It was, again, out of the rebellious uh, nature of the children of Israel. They complained there was no food. It's out of complaint. Ah, you brought us into this wilderness to die. You don't give us any food. Right? Um, it, it, it signified that. And it signified Aaron's rod because they are to be led by... A, it is a shepherd's rod, actually. Uh, they are to be led by the Ten Commandments. But ultimately, God's mercy covers over these things. Meaning to say, His mercy is greater than the laws, the Ten Commandments. Yeah? Uh, yet, it is also established on the basis of the law. In the Day of Atonement, only once a year, only the high priest can go in and make an atonement and meet with God in a sense uh, to, to meet with God yeah, uh, in the presence of God, in the Holy of Holies. So to worship God, there has to be sacrifice and washing. Without the atonement, the priests and the Levites could not serve God in the temple. The temple guardsmen were situated they will have to enforce these regulations. Yeah? So even there were temple guardsmen on duty yeah, to do that. The priests, only the priests were allowed into the temple as representatives of the children of Israel, and only the high priests could enter the Holy of Holies. And only the Levitical choirs were allowed to praise. Right? Only they were allowed to sing songs, sing hymns, yeah, sing the Psalms. Uh, the people were not involved in the public and official worship of God beyond the sacrifice. The only uh, activity they could bring is bring their own animals and their bread. <laughs> That's all they could bring uh, to participate. But the rest from that, they cannot participate in the worship activities. This is in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah? So the work of the priests were daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. It is again and again and again, 24 hours in a day. If you notice, there was no chair in the tabernacle and the temple, right? There was no furniture for sitting. <laughs> there was no need because the priest had to always move about and going to and fro, yeah? Uh, there was no need of it. Um, and the, the sacrifices, again, were offered for sins done out of ignorance. There was no atonement for purposeful sins, as we have read in Numbers 15, yeah? But why do we look at that? Why do we go through that? Well, it's because this is, in a sense, is a shadow of the gospel. You see, you can find the significance of the gospel and Jesus Christ in each of these furnitures because he fulfilled ultimately the temple, the sacrifices, and the, its furnishings. Yeah? And so it, this model was given to Moses from Sinai to signify something greater that is to come. And that is Jesus Christ, the new covenant worship. It's like uh, having a toy car. You know, yeah, you know, the Jews will 
take these things to be very precious to them and say this is the only way to worship God and they say oh this is yeah prescribed but the point of this is this is like a toy car this toy car is not the real thing it signifies something real we can have a Ferrari toy car but is it the end of it no it is meant to show us oh this is the model of the Ferrari the real Ferrari that is to come for example this is just an illustration yeah so this is a temple um, in a, if you would like the version 1.0 yeah because ultimately it points to Christ fulfillment of atonement God prepared Christ to become the final offering. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 to 6. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, uh, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou has had no pleasure. Jesus is our burnt offering. It points to Jesus. First Peter chapter one verse eighteen nineteen. For as for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Jesus himself became, in a sense, the ultimate fulfillment of the burnt offering, the lamb of God who was slain. Yeah? Jesus himself fulfilled the cereal offering. He was the bread of life. Right? Romans 5.19, For as by one man's Adam, disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So Adam sinned, he disobeyed God. All of humanity sinned and experienced death. But so is true Jesus, one man, the new Adam, the second Adam. Uh, those who believe in him came after him and rely, put their faith in him. Uh, all will be made righteous. Yeah. Jesus is our peace offering because in Ephesians 2.14, Jesus himself is our peace. He has made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So he established and mediated peace between us and God. Jesus is our sin offering, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, it does not mean that Jesus is made sin literally in a sense. He became uh, the embodiment of sin, no. But what it means here is that he bore all the penalty, the punishment for all the sins that was committed um, unintentionally and intentionally yeah? um, so that we may be made righteous before God. Jesus is our trespass offering. Made, uh, Mark 10, 45 For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Yeah? Ultimately, he is our temple. Now there is no physical temple. There is only the spiritual temple. And we are the spiritual temple, right? Uh, scriptures say. Um, if Jesus is the sacrifice, he fulfills the bronze altar. Uh, Jesus is the leper. Ephesians 5.25 uh, to 27 Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word so there is no longer a literal labor where you wash your hands in 
but Christ himself washes us. He makes our hands and hands clean, not just our hands, our hearts clean as well. Yeah. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Jesus is the lampstand. John 8, 12, then spake Jesus uh, again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is the table of showbread. John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus is the altar of incense. Romans 8, 34, it is Christ that died. Yeah, rather that is reason again. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Remember, the pre that's what the priest does, right? He intercedes for the people at the altar of incense. Yeah? So all this has its significance. Because to the Jews who read the New Testament, they are reminded of the significance of all the furnitures of the temple. The significance of the temple itself. So these are not just random, uh, uh, um, random imageries that Jesus chose or the gospel writers chose. Oh, Jesus is the bread of life. You know, uh, Jesus is, you know, uh, yada, you know, he, he is the water of life. He's, it's not just random imagery. It has a significance in the Old Testament. It shows Jesus is the fulfillment of all this. Jesus, in, in fact, is the Ark of the Covenant, Hebrews 9, 11 to 12. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the priests in the Old Testament had to do his duties again and again, non-stop. Christ, the high priest, entered once and for all, offered himself once and for all, satisfied the sins of his people. All the wrath of God, of every sin of his people, not for everyone else, his people, <laughs> new Israel, the church, those who have faith in Christ, right? He, he satisfied that. So Jesus is our great high priest. We have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is better than a priest. Hebrews 5.5 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son today, have I begotten thee? He is better than a priest. He is the Son of God. Yeah. So, because of what Christ has done, He fulfills um, the significance, all the furnishings, the, te the temple. In fact, all the, the worship of the Old Testament points to the worship that Jesus is about to institute for the church. Yeah. It is, a, in, if you like, a shadow. The shadow is not the real object, isn't it? You see a shadow, oh, you only see the silhouette, the contours yeah, in the Old Testament. But when the New Testament comes, you see everything in full glory, in full manifestation. And that came with Jesus when he came. When he came uh, that's what we see in the Gospels, in the, the epistles. Yeah? So what G when Jesus came and he instituted a worship, he instituted a better worship because we don't need to do what the old Israel did in the old covenant, right? We don't need to bring you know, uh, uh, sacrifices to the temple. There's no need for physical temple yeah? because his work is complete. What Jesus has done, his work is completed. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Since Jesus has fulfilled the temple and the sacrifices and he has gone to, to heaven, the true temple, 
Therefore, there is no need for an earthly temple anymore. Yeah. So these things, the author of Hebrews call it, has become obsolete. Obsolete. We don't need to go to the temple in Jerusalem right now. In fact, there is no temple right now. Yeah. And so the old and the new is contrasted. Yeah. One model of worship instituted at Sinai. But in the New Testament, a new system of worship is instituted in Zion. Hebrews 12 verses 18 and 22. For you have not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempers, that is Sinai, yeah, in the Old Testament, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So we know the worship that is being instituted is not of Sinaitic, but of Zion. Yeah. We come to the heavenly place uh, of, of Zion. So in, when you look both together, Sinai worship, system of worship, and Zion system of worship, the, the, the comparison is, is just uh, is to be appreciated. And so that we appreciate what Christ has done. Yeah? We talk about the revelation of God, the law and the gospel. The law is given in, Zion, in, in Sinai. The gospel is given in Zion. God spoke through the prophets, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. But now, Hebrews 1.2, God spoke through the Son. Yeah. Moses was a faithful servant uh, whose job was to testify of things that would come. He merely testified of things that would come. Again, it is a shadow. But in Zion, Jesus was better <laughs> than Moses because he was the builder of the house, a son of the house. He owned the house. <laughs> yeah, And he is the mediator of the new covenant. And Moses merely testified to Jesus. Yeah? Angels were present at the giving of the law on Sinai, but angels worshipped and served him. Yeah? In Hebrews 1, verses 4 to 7 and 14, angels worshipped Jesus. Yeah? The law was given in a spectacular manner, uh, and the law was about tabernacle, priests, and sacrifice. But Christ died for sinners to save them. All things become subjected to him. Uh, he calls those whom he saves his brethren and worships with them. It is a better sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, the covenant, in terms of the covenant, in Sinai, God found fault with the Old Covenant. You see, in the Ark of the Covenant, remember just now we saw there is a tablet. If God were to look only at the Ten Commandments, at Aaron's butt, Aaron failed to lead his people, by the way. <laughs> All right? In the building of the Golden Calf, remember, Aaron succumbed to the sins of Israel. He gave in in building the golden uh, uh, calf and also the manna which does not last the manna rots the day after right the manna can only last for one day if god looks at these things it is not lasting in fact he will find fault with the children of israel but thanks be to god because the ark of the covenant foreshadowed that god rather sees the children of israel with mercy rather than the Ten Commandments, rather than Aaron's butt, rather than the manna, which reminds God of their complaint and reminds that these are just temporal, but His mercy is eternal and it, is, it covers all of the sins of Israel and it foreshadows Christ. 
Uh, God would make a new covenant instead. Yeah? It was weak. Hebrews 7, 18, the ceremonial laws made no one perfect. They had to continually offer uh, sacrifices. These were only shadows. Yeah? But in Zion, God would reveal himself in Christ Jesus to the people and would cleanse them in their heart and put his laws within them. The priesthood was not perfect in the Old Testament. Yeah? Uh, the annual sacrifice was a continual reminder that the worshippers was not cleansed. That's the point of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is to remind Israel that their sins are not cleansed. They have to wait for that day. They have to keep waiting. Uh, done already. They have to keep waiting for next year. It's never enough. It's never done. But Jesus came and he changed the priesthood. Yeah. into perfection. Yeah. The people were also disobedient. Even though God redeemed them from Egypt, they could not and did not want to draw near because it was foreboding. Remember, in Sinai, God thundered in, uh, and there was darkness and there, there was thunder and lightning yeah. and, and fire came on Sinai and the people's response was what? Moses, you go. I I am gonna stay back. Yeah? That was Sinai worship. And it's true in the tabernacle, the people cannot enter into the tabernacle, only the priests. But it foreshadows something better. God promised an exclusive loving relationship. They will know him all. Israel, all new Israel, will know God and he would perfect them so they can draw near to him. So Zion worship is about his people drawing near to God in the presence of God. Yeah. So Jesus' work is complete, 10, 12, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 12. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Are there any chairs in the tabernacle, in the temple? No, but there is the throne, the chair in the heavenly places, Zion, where Jesus as the high priest, he has done his work. He can sit down, signifying that he has rested. The work is complete. It is finished. And since Jesus has fulfilled the temple and the sacrifices, and he has gone to heaven, the true temple, therefore there is no need for an earthly temple anymore. So we don't need the physical temple anymore. John 4, 21 to 24, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when you shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father, you worship you not you know not what we worship what we worship because the Jews know who they worship they know who God is right uh, but the Samaritans do, do not yeah and when uh, but the hour cometh sorry for salvation is of the Jews um, but the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the father seeks such to worship him god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth and when jesus said these words and the hour that is to come to worship him in spirit and in truth he instituted a better worship of system of worship now is in spirit and in truth is it the same thing It is actually, <laughs> the answer is, it is distinct, but inseparable. Yeah, It is distinct, you can distinct the two, but it is inseparable. In truth, what does it mean when Jesus said that? In truth, it is the OT, the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament actually taught the gospel in pictures, 
But in the New Testament, it teaches the gospel by words. The OT only gives pictures of the Old Testament, yeah, uh, of the gospel. But the New Testament teaches it using words. <laughs> yeah. It emphasizes on salvation by the truth. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, salvation by truth. Yeah. It, it also emphasizes on growth by the word. First uh, Peter 2, uh, verse 2. As newborn babies, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Yeah. It also emphasizes on holiness by the word. John 17, verse 17. Sanctifying them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So it is truth. Um, has to do with truth. So worship under Christ involves in the truth of the word of God. Uh, so this is what anti uh, New Testament worship is all about. It is all about the worship. Uh, it's all about the word of God. Uh, so in the New Testament, we do. That's why we do the public reading, public reading of the word. Uh, just as in the Old Testament, they publicly read the Torah, the law. Yeah? Here in the New Testament, right, uh, it is commanded in 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. It also involves preaching of the word. Yeah? Uh, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Acts twenty twenty seven. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Singing of the word, yeah. It, in the New Testament, we also sing the word, yeah. Ephesians five nineteen. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. Um, can you tell me, anyone tell me, are these things different? Sing, speaking to yourselves in psalms, in hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. Are they the same thing or different things? They are the same thing. <laughs> Actually, it basically, it is singing of the word. Because every singing that we do has to be based on the word of God. Scriptural truth. Is, is it, Joshua, yeah, yeah, sure. Is it during the worship or is it when you are... Very good question. Um, yeah, very good question. I will, this, this question will be answered later on. Yeah, sure, no worries. Uh, because I have one brother of mine that asked me the same question. Um, and, and actually, it is, um, there is much to be clarified there. Um, praying the Bible. Yeah? Uh, worshipping in truth also involves praying the Bible. Yeah? 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. God's will is sufficiently disclosed in Scripture. How do you know God's will? It is only by Scripture alone. Scripture is the written disclosure of the revelation of God. And it discloses His will for us as the church. Yeah? In spirit, what does that mean? In spirit. Firstly, this teaches us that worship is from the heart and it is internal. It is from the heart and it is internal. True worship is not about holy places. <laughs> That's why Jesus say, you do not need to go to this mountain or go to the temple to worship anymore. But worship is in spirit and in truth. In spirit, meaning to say it is from the heart, internal. There, there is no need for holy buildings or holy sites. Uh, it does not matter where you meet for worship. You could meet for worship under a tree. 
yeah, but if it is directed to God, yeah, its activities are directed to God, that is worship already. And it is acceptable to God. In spirit also means God dwells in his spirit, uh, in his people by his spirit. Yeah. First Peter 2 5. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house uh, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Remember in the Old Testament, only the priests, right, can enter into the presence of God, the tabernacle. Now, all God's people are made priests. We are priests before God. We have a priesthood, and therefore all of us can enter into the presence of, presence of God, and our worship are acceptable because of in Christ. Because we are in Christ, we are our sacrifices, our prayer, our praise are acceptable to God. Secondly, this teaches us that worship is simple. And we have to emphasize this. Worship is to be simple. Uh, there are no fancy ceremonies. No Jerusalem, no temple, no Levitical choirs, uh, no furniture, uh, no priestly garments, and no rituals to be involved in the act of worship. Uh, praise is singing done from the heart. Ephesians 5.19 Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So worship is centered around the word. Acts 2.42 As they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Yeah? But how must we still worship? Has God changed? Does simple mean without reverence and awe? No. It does not mean that simple means we can do whatever we like. It does not mean that we is without reverence and awe. Yeah? Rever uh, Hebrews 12, 28-29 wherefore, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear and so the summary is this to approach god in worship there must be atonement yeah the temple in the old testament showed the gospel through the furniture and the rituals yeah it shows what? It shows ultimately Jesus in the New Testament who came to fulfill the temple and system of worship that he, he instituted is in spirit and in truth. And lastly, New Testament Christians do what the priests do without the temple. So we are the priests, but we don't need the temple physical temple. We are the temple already because the Holy Spirit indwells within us.